Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. T minus. As long as you're not on that SpaceX rocket that exploded yesterday, you're probably good to go. Oh, I did not hear that. <laughs> yeah, one of our uh, customer success folks like follows that religiously, and he uh, maybe it was a couple days ago, but um, yeah, it was it was not fun to hear. There weren't any people on it, of course. It was one of their test rockets, but. Let's see here. Oh. <laughs> Good panel. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> All right. So we're going to, I know technically it's 8, 8 a.m. Central Time right now, but we're going to give folks a few minutes just because, uh, well, you know, you, you, a lot of people are a few minutes later. So, so we'll, we'll give it a little more time before we actually start. Yeah. Can you see how many people are online? Yeah, two, 208 at the moment. Ah, uh, two twelve. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Yeah, that's ticking up uh, more and more. I fear once it kind of slows down and we give a, a reasonable amount of time for for folks, then we can maybe get going. But usually, we give it to like five after or something like that. Nobody else is wearing their cool sunglasses. No, where do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, too late. It was, in, it was in the zoom, like near your video, there's like an up arrow, and you can go on like vi video filters and virtual backgrounds. The filters are the ones that kind of go on top. Yep, Jason just got to deal with it. <laughs> oh, so they can hear us now? Uh, yes, yes, they can hear us now. <laughs> kind of chatting. All right. Brian yeah, and. Brian and Donna had all kinds of fun, interesting things to say before they started. <laughs> I almost messed up again. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Flashbacks from our the last uh, web, webinar. Yeah, that, was that, that, that was fun. I think it makes it fun to have a little, you know, friendly banter before it starts. And Yeah, I just answered my first question as well from Gary Block. <laughs> you were banned from asking questions. <laughs> Or Gary. Hey, coach. Uh, I I am I'm the one who's who's honored. Thank you. Live. I first got to see you, David. I think I met you at uh, MS Jazz Edition. Was that, that your is first? Right. MS. That is Never. right. I remember Gary raving about you being like the best co-presenter because you brought him like a um, a gift bag or something like that. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I guess they, they only do that in Texas. Uh, I felt kind of weird, uh, you know, about it. <laughs> so thought, is, okay, is mine in the I'm... post, David? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I but the U.S. post, so it's going to take you six months to get to you. Ah, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> so. You'll get a better cup. Uh, wow. Let's, let's un <laughs> can we unblur this? Yeah, you can, you can send me one of those vaccines you've got going spare over there as well, could you? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if they'll refrigerate it correctly all the way there. But... <laughs> I'll try yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, so Gary got a, a cup like this. Uh, come and take it. <laughs> all right. Similar, but uh, this one's even bigger. So, yes, I, I will get it to you in post. <laughs> Just wait till um, Miami in uh, October for MS Miami Beach edition. Oh wow! You going to that? Yeah, well, I guess cost. they're they're supposedly going to open up um, call for speakers and registration pretty soon. Um, let's see. I just realized it's eight oh three. We got over three hundred folks here. We get like so one good. more minute or something for people to join before we get started. Yeah, yeah I I gotta say, Mark, um, I was. Uh, I was pinged to do a uh, webinar on OSD Builder, and uh, I really didn't want to do it because uh, I had been putting a lot of work into this, and uh, it just wasn't ready. And so I'm I'm very uh, privileged that um, you know, unfortunately, uh, well, I mean, 
to get the call last minute and to be able to add some of this content, uh, it kind of worked out in the end. And, and I thank Gary for uh, covering OSD Builder in a previous uh, webinar. So my apologies for not participating in that one, but uh, um, I think you'll see where all my work's been lately. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, should... Mitch, yes. Hello. Good morning from Texas. It's pro... almost light outside. Almost light all night. <laughs> we could probably get started here. It looks like it's 8.05 and the attendees have slowed down. So let's, uh, let's get going here. So uh, everybody, welcome today uh, to this uh, webinar featuring uh, Maurice Daly and... Um, David Segura, we, we originally were going to have uh, Nikolai in here, Nikolai Anderson, but he had uh, a bit of a family emergency and um, he has his priorities straight, so he's focusing on his family. And uh, David was kind enough to step up on short notice and help us out here. Um, but uh, the title here we have is uh, BIOS and Driver Updates, Past and Future. And I believe uh, David also has some other uh, secret cool new stuff he's going to show as well that's uh, uh, slightly related, but off of that. Um, do we want to get going on the slide deck? Oh, one last thing. If you have questions, please, please, please use the Q&A function. Uh, chat is virtually impossible to track questions in. So if you put a question in the chat area, no promises you're going to get a response. Please use the Q&A function. Um, so yeah, we mentioned we had two speakers. There's some info here on uh, you know where they work, where he's working for Cloudway. Uh, David's a manager for Baker Hughes. And if you don't follow them on Twitter, if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. If you don't follow them, uh, definitely do. You'll see some awesome content from them. And then their blogs are amazing. Um, Maurice blogs on msendpointmanager.com. And uh, there are also numerous other bloggers on there that uh, all, all of them have amazing content. And then David's got his osdeploy.com, which has some really cool functions as well with like OSD Builder and his his uh, cloud OSD stuff. Uh, I'm Mark Godfrey. I'm going to be moderating. I'm a software engineer at Recast Software. Uh, I won't say much other than the beginning. I'll mostly just uh, leave it to these two pros here and uh, get all the great content we have. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to Maurice and uh, David here. And everyone enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Mark. So uh, I'd just like to say, first of all, thank you for David for joining at short notice. Um, obviously, Nikolai had to step out with a family emergency. So it's great. And you've been doing some really cool stuff lately, David. So uh, I'm kind of super excited to see what you're going to demo as well. Absolutely. I, and, and hopefully maybe after this, we can uh, see how we can work together on the future. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're only a couple of hours out in the time zone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that would be cool. Um, all right, so um, let's, let's kick this off. So we're just going to talk about the past, what we all used to do in Configuration Manager. I know I used to do all this stuff. Um, talk about some of the automation stuff that uh, myself and Nikolai had been doing. Um, then we're going to look over David's solution, uh, OS Builder and, and OS Cloud. Uh, and finally, we're just going to have a bit of a chat about where we think this is going in the future, what you'd like to see, not from the community per se, okay? Because I think eventually it gets to a point where uh, the product natively has this stuff. I mean, we'd love to see that because it means that I have time to do stuff and David has time to do stuff and we have lives, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, but it, it's great. I mean, while it isn't in the product for sure, community will keep struggling to fill in the gaps. So, We've seen these screens before, David, right? Uh, let me unmute here. Uh, yes. <laughs> wow, so, what, a, what a pain. Yeah, so so what use does the uh, the driver information in the database give us? Do you, do you, have you ever used it? Uh, I, I have. Um, you know, it, it pretty much tells us everything that's in the INF, breaks down the details. Uh, if we're looking at this first screenshot, you know, we know that it's a network uh, uh, driver or system class. And, and uh, you know, when obviously when we image a machine, it's going to look and say, hey, I need these. Give them to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's right. But I mean, the, the native functionality that we've had, um, it's fair to say that, okay, your driver imports, INF files, they take time, right? They actually take a, a lot of time. So it's kind of like get your driver pack, point at it, go off and get something. To uh, yeah, dinner. go to lunch. Go yeah, lunch. exactly. Yeah, lunch, dinner, wherever you are. Um, 
then you have to assign categories. And there's a lot of um, information contained within the INF that gets dumped into the database that a lot of people don't actually use. Okay, like the version numbering and stuff like that, fine. But what you tend to do is you create a category to say it is version X of the HP driver pack, for instance. And then you, you replace it with the new version and so on. Um, so this, this is kind of like a hit and miss. I've, I've always felt that this was very hit and miss. Okay, you, you could have what they call a, like a total control approach where uh, you were really kind of uh, identifying your, your matching classes and so on. But the, the, I've heard someone mention stuff like, you know, it, it's kind of, are you feeling lucky punk approach? Um, because if you throw a, a whole bunch of drivers in, if it's one OEM, um, it tends not to be too bad. I mean, because uh, we can't have conflicting things going on, but we're going to talk about what happens um, when all of a sudden you have a mixture of OEMs in place um, um, the kind of bad stuff that can happen. Um, of course, there's other third-party utilities you can get from the OEMs themselves, like Dell, HP, Lenovo, etc. They all provide add-ins for Configuration Manager. Um, and again, you know, they are ideally suited to an environment where it is all that OEM. Um, They've gotten better. They've gotten a lot they, better. They have, yeah. yeah. In fairness, um, over the years, they have got a lot, lot better. Um, in particular, you know, I think a shout out to HP and the stuff they've been doing with their uh, uh, CMSL uh, scripts and everything like that. Um, that's come on uh, massively, and uh, that's uh, something that you can leverage into Intune as well. But configuration manager, driver management as a whole, um, hasn't really got much love for as far back as I can remember. That that's fair to say. It's fair, yes. Yeah. So, um, so in that time, well, actually, just one thing I'll talk about first, right? Here's the issue, okay, that we've all struggled with. Install only the best matched compatible drivers. Or the other one, install all compatible drivers, right? Which is like the, I just want anything <laughs> to work. Please, God, work. Um, but the, the problem is, you know, if I translate these to what they actually mean, in, in my opinion, right? So install only the best match compatible drivers. It's plug and pray, okay? It'll go down, it'll match the machine or whatever like that. But at the end of the day, it might be a bit ropey, depending on what you've got in your database. If it's nice and clean, it'll go ahead. But if you haven't maintained it properly, um, then it, it's down to like the driver ranking process, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. And the install all compatible drivers, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, uh, and th the thing is, most of the time, when, when you kind of run through this, um, we'll, we'll talk about this driver ranking now, but uh, most of the time when you run through either of those options, you will end up with a, um, a, deployed, a deployed machine. Okay. Now, it's, it's after the deployment then that you start noticing issues. And the reason, of course, can be down to what they call driver ranking. Okay. So, David, you're the expert on driver ranking. So, I'm going to let you do this. And you've muted yourself. Yes. I, I think uh, Johan's actually the, the first one uh, who really uh, broke this down for me. Um, but yes, and, and, and I'll add to the fact that when we, when we do this method, it has to be tested. I mean, uh, uh, you're never sure if it's going to work. You have to try it on the physical hardware. And I think that's also been a challenge for us admins to actually have to test on the physical device uh, before uh, pushing it out. So uh, as Maurice was saying, uh, the potential issue, the driver ranking. So when you have multiple uh, drivers that target the same plug and play ID, hardware ID, whatever you want to call it, uh, Windows is going to decide what's best. And, and what you're looking at on this slide is, is the equation on how it bring, breaks it down. Um, I'm not seeing a date, you know, I believe date, you know, how new is the driver as part of this, the, the version and it, and it assigns it what, uh, what's called a signature score, lower the number of the better uh, the choice, and that's the one that that's going to get picked. Um, did I did I get yeah, that? 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So the, the point is, okay, it gives you the signature score. It also gives it a feature score and an identifier score. Um, and it then what works out what's the best compatible driver, okay? So if if we're looking for the closest ranking match, it'll be, you know, as it says there, it's kind of 0x000, okay? Which means it's a, an identical hardware ID match. Um, but the, the problem with driver ranking, as you've seen before, David, is... If you have like a mixture of OEMs in your environment, it can be the case that they use the same Realtek network card. Let's just, you know, take a random brand that could be in uh, multiple machines. And one vendor will pay more for certain features than another. So you might end up having what appears to be like the same kind of uh, hardware, um, but they have subtle different features. And because of the way Windows N is, is ranking the driver, it could be a case that you will end up with a, uh, a HP driver that th thinks it's better for Dell than the Dell driver is. And that will work. I mean, nine times out of 10, it will work and everything seems okay. Um, and we can see this here identified in, in the hardware and compatible IDs, okay? So, Having a, a real hardware match is not the same as having a compatible hardware match. And this is where it, the problems start because then you have a machine that gets deployed and it's got a driver that was say destined for a HP machine on a Dell machine. And everything seems okay at the start. Okay, device managers are okay, all, everything's installed. But when you start working away, you might have the user reporting issues you know, the stability issues or, you know, Windows 10 does a great job today because of the fact that we don't get these blue screens of death all the time. Okay. If, if a driver crashes, it will restart it in the background. But if you check the um, reliability uh, monitor, you might see that there's actually a lot going on and it can be down to um, uh, driver crashes. Um, and this is why, I mean, this is the, the issue with driver ranking. So it ends up, you know, being, you know, kind of, did it work? Yes, everything everything feels good, right? Uh, but is it stable? No. <laughs> okay, yeah. And this is this guy on the on the right tends to be uh, the person who who's like at the help desk getting the calls from an end user, whereas this person on the left is just the guy that created the task sequence and deployed, and and it worked, right? So um, I, I I almost look at this a little different. I see the guy on the left is the user who doesn't have any blue screens, <laughs> and we're the guy on the right going. We know it's going to blue screen sooner or later. You know, we just don't know when. Yeah, exactly. So so the point being is, that, I mean, back in the past when we had these issues, we've all come across, like across them, um, and then we started using various different methods, such as what you know, ended up being kind of called the total control method where we had specific driver packs and we would do WMI filters on everything. Um, and that works. It works perfectly well. Um, I know a lot of companies still doing it. Um, in fact, the, the, the longest task sequence I've seen had about 70 models in it, um, which, you know, can be a struggle to maintain. Um, <clears throat> so, um, my journey then into like automation started and much like yours, David, I'm sure like it's, uh, how can I do this better for me? Not necessarily for everyone else at the start. Okay. It sounds selfish, but it's, it's not, I'll get there. Um, but if you're an admin working in, in a job, you want to do things. So what for me, I said, right. I know that once a month I go off and I download driver packs from Dell, for instance. I import them in. I change all the driver packs in the uh, WMI, in sorry in my WMI filters so that it's now selecting you know A09 instead of A07 and so on stuff like that. Um, and I really just wanted to to automate that whole process because we've all got better things to do at times, right? So my goal was learn PowerShell, for instance. I really didn't have too much of a grasp of PowerShell. Um, and there, there was a, 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 an event I, I went to um, back many years ago where one of the attend or sorry, one of the speakers actually said, you know, if you don't learn, learn PowerShell, learn how to say, hey, do you want fries with that? Um, you know, okay, probably a little extreme, but at the same time, 
if if you're doing something repetitive, PowerShell is is key. I mean, today it's it's vital. Um, so I wanted to automate processes that took up time and repetitive, and optimize always deployment times. Because my goal really was, I want this thing. If you have a problem with your machine, you come back in an hour after your lunch or whatever like that, and the whole machine's reimaged. Okay, that was kind of my side of things. Um, and when I started on this journey, like back in I suppose 2013, 2012 or something like that. Um, I was reading books by these guys. So, you know, Johan Wardermark, I was looking at what Kim Up and Apple Fence was doing um, and understanding how to use tools like DISM and PMP Util um, to, to automate this stuff. And, it, you know, it kind of took a couple of iterations where, first of all, you know, my key thing was, okay, I've automated the download side. Okay, that's kind of cool. All right, so but I now go in and I still extract everything and look. Well, that's not really great. So uh, now I'll I'll do that side of things. And I ended up um, just importing drivers in the same way that were standard drivers. But when we started looking at what um, Kim in particular was doing at the time um, with his holy grail of driver management, was uh, moving away from driver packs to standard packs and just using DISM. So that's why, like I said there, I was looking at using DISM and PMP util. Um, and this is kind of like how it's going now. Um, so together with a, a, a fellow colleague, a friend of mine, Nicola Anderson, um, we came up with a solution called Modern Driver and Bias Management. It's been around for a few years. There are many other solutions out there. It's, and they all have benefits and drawbacks and everything like that. Okay. Key thing is they're all community. Um, so you can get the content, you can get the code, and you can make tweaks and whatever you want. Okay. Um, it's fair to say, David, I'm sure you're in the same boat that we don't offer uh, like a support call helpline or anything like that. Well, I, I think, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we, we develop these things because we need them and we, we share them out for, for everyone else. Um, uh, in, in my case, you know, I'm building these because I need them for my enterprise. But, it, you know, if I can share with someone and they can they can take from that and, and either uh, collaborate, contribute, build off of it, or use it to save them some effort, then, you know, that's all that matters. It's, it's about sharing. And, and, and this is exactly how, you know, your modern driver management started. Yeah, exactly. You know, kind of the key thing is, I suppose, though, that everything is open source. And when, when people have, you know, these kind of discussions with their managers, you know, okay, is this a, like a product we can buy? I, I've had that question before. And, no, no, you just download it and do what you want with it kind of thing. Um, but, but the point is, it, it's community um, supported. Um, and I, like I go into Reddit and stuff like that, and you often see people discussing, oh, have you implemented this? Have you implemented that? And I couldn't get that to work. And people then saying, oh, well, this is actually how you do it. And that kind of, it's like, it's like a virtual help desk there in a forum somewhere uh, for people that have done this stuff. But um but yeah, I mean, t today, right, so the solution that, that we came up with um, has had over 60,000 downloads. I, I know it's in use by Fortune 500 companies um, and has support for HP, Lenovo, Dell, and Microsoft models. Now, I know, okay, there are some issues. Um, like everything, over the, this past year has been, in particular, a massive struggle because um, what's the one thing that everyone wanted to do? Get yeah everything into the cloud, right? And uh, you know, get CMG, Intune, everything like that, because we're all re working remotely. And um, my line of business being a consultant, that's what I do. Um, so it has been a very busy year. Um, so I know there's some issues. I'm actually working on an update, which I was doing this morning, um, trying to iron out some of the stuff I saw on GitHub. Um, you know, when, when we started going down this journey, some of the stuff that wasn't there, okay, we didn't have feeds from uh, Lenovo, for instance. So um, Joe Parker and Lenovo, um, great that the community can do this. And we reach out to someone online and all of a sudden we have a contact in Lenovo who's going to do this stuff for us. And he spoke to me and we came up with um, what the XML should look like. And basically he kind of grew it from there to the point where the XML that they develop now is in use by their own products primarily, but it was developed off the back of this, which is kind of cool. 
Um, the Microsoft it, stuff it is very clean. I gotta say, Lenovo is just very clean. Yeah, um, it 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 is. Um, and, and that's yeah. What's what we liked about it? Some of the I mean, Dell has had historic one for for many years. It it's very large. It's, it can be quite troublesome to par- parse it sometimes. Um, HP also have very good feeds, but again, a lot in there. Um, the Microsoft unfortunately don't. Um, it's one of the things. But again, I it's about resourcing, right? Um, and there needs to be someone there to, to do this on a daily, monthly basis and so on. Um, and, you know, natively their own product will handle Surface devices. So um, that's no issue with them. We can maintain that directly. Um, but the other things we've done is we've added in firmware update support and compression support, and that's based on feedback from the community. So um, I, I forget who it was. I think it was Martin Bengston. Um, was did a blog post on um, uh, wind compression, for instance. And then there was someone else before that did it one on seven zip. And I know Yo- Johan Erdmark then did a follow-up where he did a uh, comparison between all the different methods, including the download time, the extraction time, and so on. Um, so but we've added all those in based on um, what you guys uh, would like to do. Um, and if it's me today, I, I tend to go with the WIM format because it's native, it's, it's still heavy compression. Um, and you can typically see, if we talk about downloading, you know, thousand different files out of a driver pack compared to downloading one file on WIM, it, it's going to do it in kind of like half the time. You know, I typically seen uh, the driver step kind of drop from maybe eight minutes down to three and four minutes. Um, but this, yeah, so it's, I mean, this thing started off as a community-based scripting uh, effort for from, from me. Um, and I, I know, David, yours is still very much command line as well. Um, yes, yes. And, and, and like what that. kind of feedback do you get from people on that? Because I know when I started that, it, some people just don't like PowerShell and, and they prefer a GUI. It, it, it's like a... Yeah, server core versus the server yeah. with the, with, yeah, the UI, you know? Um, you know, honestly, um, I need to learn how to make GUIs. Uh, so uh, part of my decision has been a personal struggle. Um, uh, keeping in mind, this is not what I do. I'm, I'm not a consultant uh, and, and it, it's, it's a time I, I, I put in as much time as I can. Would I like to do more? Would I like to make a, a pretty front end? Absolutely. Uh, am, am I asking for people to contribute? Yes, let's do this. Let's make it better for the community. But, you know, I do think there's, you know, your people are, everyone's going to be split. You know, some are going to want a GUI. Um, your hardcore people are probably going to want to stick with command line. I think offering both um, is probably ideal for the community. You know, having it work in command line and making a front end for it for those who uh, want a little more um, um, user friendly experience. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I kind of went from one way to the other. And now I'm kind of going back to what you say, kind of maybe try to get back into that middle space. Because like if I, if I look at that solution, like and this is just the, the bit that downloads, you know, it's not like the, the matching parts. It's like seven point three thousand lines of uh, of code, uh, but when it's compiled, it's twenty one point five thousand lines of code with all the UI. Uh, I mean, it's still like one point two meg of a file. You know, it's not that's not really the issue, but um, it's uh, I I found that the UI itself uh, go back sorry, um, just got more traction. People found it easier. I don't know, like I see there in, in the chat window going on, like you know, command line for the win. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I love the command line too. Um, but it was just the reason I did this was just to make it easy for people. Um, and of course, it brings its own, its own challenges then with people like 4K screens and stuff. But hey, look. Um, okay. And then, um, so basically, I, I developed that, that side of things. And then uh, Nick and I developed the deployment scripts. Um, and we started developing these together based on different manufacturers. Um, all of this stuff is available on GitHub, and uh, I'll, I'll show the scripts and things like that in a second. Um, but basically, it's doing a very simple job. 
So when we started looking at how to match drivers, the first thing that we, we all probably think of is, surely we can just match, match on the model name, right? Oh, <laughs> I, I can see David laughing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show an example of that. Um, Go for it. Uh, well, you know, when, when we do some of my demo, there is, there is no model. There's no way to enter a model. Don't even care about model because it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't. It might work for some, but not everything. It's correct. Yeah. And, and the reason is, uh, like, I, I, I won't mention the, the person, but um, there's one person who works in OEM and he says, yeah, marketing, just go nuts. Um, and, and we can see that, you know, um, like certain manufacturers, we might see um, the same baseboard value being used in a load of different model names. Um, and that can cause problems because, um, uh, and I'm sure you've seen that, David, like, so typically the baseboard value, let's just say, right, HP is an example. Um, the baseboard value should be a unique identifier for that model. Yeah, and that's what you're using, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they yeah, should. Yeah. But like, like, like you said, they like to add things like, you know, if you look at it like a, a truck, you know, you've got the Texas edition F-150. Well, it's the same as the Oklahoma edition. They just, again, like you said, marketing, they just need to call it something to make those sales, maybe. I have a Silverado. Yeah. <laughs> Silverado. <laughs> I, I just know that they're big trucks, right? I, I, I don't see any driving around here. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like I, the whole thing was that when we started looking at this, so Dell have a system skew, HP have a baseboard value, Lenovo have a baseboard value as well. And they are the unique identifiers that we should use. And that's what we have been using. But there are exceptions. Okay, like I take, take a HP Elite Book 840, G5, sorry, G6, and then 50 G6. They have the same baseboard value. And, they, and a Z book also has the same baseboard value, which then makes it quite difficult. Uh, we, we've kind of had to change the scripts a couple of times to cater, cater for that. Um, but that's kind of ex exceptions, you know. But what it ends up is, is something like this, where the model, let's say, is a HP ZBook Studio X360 G5, but the system name inside their, um, uh, their XML says it's a HP ZBook Studio X360 G5 convertible workstation. So uh, I, I imagine that's marketing, and this is tech. Um, so, but um, yeah, but again, you can see the system IDs and that's what matches the baseboard value. And that's how we do the matching, of course. So uh, let me get do a bit of a quick demo on this. Um, and then we're gonna uh, go and have a look at uh, Dave's solution. Does this screen look okay? Can you see this? That looks good. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so just to break it down it's it's really simple okay but here we have like an we'll call it an old school task sequence right where we have the apply driver step and we've got this one here the am i feeling lucky punk button turned on so we're just going to take everything and hope for the best right um and if you were to do a total control approach you are going to end up with a whole bunch of nested um groups and, and entries for every single model Okay, we all know how to do that. We all know how to use filtering. Um, and then just to compare what we would do then in the solution that, that uh, myself and Nikolai came up with, um, we would just literally just run. The way I set this up is I usually create a, um, a, a child task sequence. So I've got one here, building blocks, modern driver management. And if we have a look at see what that is. Uh, I'm just catering for the different uh, types of uh, deployment that you might be doing. So I can feed that in from the parent uh, uh, task sequence um, where we're going to say, okay, it's, it's always deployment. And all you need to do is specify the um, PowerShell script, uh, the mode. So it's bare metal in this case, your endpoint, because now we're starting to use the admin service API. Uh, so if you're still using the web service, you can, you can decommission it if you're not using the OSD front end. Um, so you just put in your server name. And of course we need now to put in target OS version. 
Um, in the, the web service prior, we were able to detect that by just reading in the task sequence details, but um, a little trickier. So um, you just need to specify that in, but you will have WMI filters here if we say the, the OS upgrade TS not equals true. So you can control it that way, or else I'll have another one here, which is MDM update. Um, and then we can go in and we can see if we're just doing an update, for instance, um, this is uh, a driver update. So this is like post OS deployment kind of stuff. Um, so we just put in driver update, endpoint, and your server. Okay. And it uses the current Windows build information, goes off, and talks to the admin service and gets back the latest driver. And then it uses PNP util. So that's the only real difference between the OSD, the upgrade, uh, oh, sorry, the up OSD and upgrade and the update stage is that OSD and upgrade use DISM and the up, update one uses PNP util. So it'll only update what it needs to. Um, but it's, it's super simple. Um, and it ends up generating a, uh, a, a log file. Uh, so during a task sequence deployment, uh, let me get this across into the screen. Too many windows open. There we go. Okay. Um, so during the, the task sequence, then we will end up with something like this. So it, it outputs uh, some log files so we can see what's going on. If we just take a look at the apply driver package. Okay, so here we can see um, that the, the model is a, a Latu 5500. Uh, system SKU has been detected as 08B9. Um, make that bigger. Um, and then it's gonna start talking to the admin service, okay? So um, it's gonna pull back a bunch of, of uh, driver packs, for instance. And we can see that if we just go back into the server um, <clears throat> and we click on here, this is basically what's coming back out. So we're just gonna convert this into something that's readable in terms of XML and so on. Um, and then we're gonna do some matching. Um, and this is basically the same kind of output that we used to do when we queried the web service, okay? Um, that was just naturally dumped back in, uh, in XML, of course. And then the only thing that we're really doing, concern ourselves with, is inside the description of the, uh, the driver pack. So the model's included. So these are the unique baseboard identifiers for that model. Okay, and that's how we do the matching. Um, um, if we go back here, we end up then, it, it starts doing some logic check, checks through the, the process, right? So we can see that the, um, the target operating system there was Windows 10, and it's a 64-bit build, and it's uh, 2004 build of Windows. And it will start working out then, okay, it'll do, run this detection. Now this is Dell, so Dell don't actually have um, build specific driver packs, um, but in the end it will um, work out if there's a driver pack available, uh, it will then, you'll see it set the, um, the package download and it downloads it and sets a, um, a task sequence variable to tell it where to install the drivers from. Um, in this case, it was using 7-zip as well. Although today um, I would probably just stick with WIM at this stage, because as I said, the, the compression is is nearly as good and um, it's better at deduplication inside the content store. Um, and, you know, it's similar for HP. Um, just quickly look at this. Of course, with HP, there's, there's build specific packs. So here's one for uh, 1809. Um, and then it starts going through and we can see we've got 1909 there and it's the same model, but it's a different build. Uh, and eventually after it goes down, again, it will determine which, uh, which package is the right one, download it and install it. So driver package ranking, if, if you may. Kind of, yeah, driver package ranking. Didn't think of it like that, but yes, that's exactly what it's doing. Um, and it, it's the same for the firmware. And, and the only other thing with the firmware is you end up with uh, a couple of extra logs, right? So we've got the, 
here's Adele. So we have an invoke bias um, uh, download where it's it's come on and it's pre-staged. This is for a precision uh, three four three one, um, and we end up then having another log file that we can check to see what actually happened. All right. So in this case, um, we can see that. Uh, it's, it's updated to version 1.91 of the BIOS um, and it's rebooted, which, which, you know, at the time, I'm oh, sorry, version 1.10.1 was the update. So it wasn't 191. Um, and, you know, firmware updates is actually a big thing from a security point of view. Um, so if you have the opportunity to image a machine, um, absolutely make sure the firmware is up to date. And even after the machine ships, you should be patching the firmware. Um, so this solution will do that in, in all eventualities. Um, as I said, I am working on some other bits as well. And if we go back here, one of the things I'm actually working on, um, is, let me share this out. Um, so first of all, some people have, have said, okay, they don't like the way they have to go and download the latest version every so often when I update it. So I've added in a new ex executable that will run as a child process when the, uh, the new version starts, uh, sorry, when the current version starts, and then it will check to see if there's a new version available, download it from GitHub, stop this, restart the new version, and all that kind of stuff. So that's coming. Uh, the other thing that I've seen people um, mentioning a couple of times is the, the ongoing link changes that we have for the Dell Flash utility. Um, I really love that if they could just put that in one place and just update it there, um, that would be kind of cool. Um, but unfortunately, they don't. Uh, they keep creating a new link every time they, uh, they build a new one. I and think unless... there's four of them now. There's oh, four. God. There's four of them uh, at this uh, moment. The latest one they've released in a, as an EXE only. Can't uh, extract that in. Uh... I'm sorry, it's an EXE compressed. EXE. Uh, oh, wow. Nice. Okay, <laughs> so EXE compressed EXE. Okay, so then I have some additional work to do. Um, but uh, yeah, but what I've, I've done in the new version is all the links that were hard coded in the tool, um, I put them into an XML file. Um, and what will happen is when the tool launches, it will check to see if the version is the same. If it is, it just goes okay and it reads the local one. Uh, if it isn't, it will download the updated version. So that way, I, if someone comes out and says, uh, you know, here's version 3.3.11 of the, the Flash utility, it's just come out, I can just go and edit the XML and I don't need to do anything else. Um, so that should you know, improve things a little bit. Um, other things I'm going to do is probably remove this web service and also I'll be... I'll be adding an Intune section. I mean, it's something that we kind of toyed around with for the past year, but Microsoft have got better in their approach with, with Intune and, and with, um, with OEMs as well. So a lot of the struggles that OEMs had in terms of getting their latest drivers into the Windows for Update store uh, are gone today. Um, so you should be essentially getting the latest published release from them. Um, and, and, you know, some of our customers actually want a control method over that. So they still want like the configuration manager style approach of saying, I have um, the uh, Dell driver pack A09 deployed. So they kind of want that. Um, and what we're doing there is just basically based on checking XML in, in uh, uh, Azure um, and then downloading that on the fly onto the machines. So those are kind of things that are coming. Um, and I, I'd love to be getting some feedback on this. And I can see that the, uh, the chat is going a bit, uh, a mile a minute at the moment. So um, I, I'll definitely catch up on that as I can go. And, and like Mark said, if you can use the Q&A as well. Um, yeah, we, we have like 19 questions in Q&A right now. Most are <laughs> regarding uh, the driver update tool. I imagine when... Uh, David switches over to present. Maurice can kind of answer some of these. I've answered a few, but most of them are uh, very specific about the tool itself, which is more Maurice's alley. Yeah, I, I think so. So, um, okay, so that's that's kind of my solution in the nutshell. So, um, 
take it away, David. Let's, uh, let's bring this up again, get full screen. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we all know what COVID has done. It's, it's sent everybody in our office home. Uh, I, I, and I work on a floor, second floor, that typically has probably 60 or 70 people. In there, and there have been days over the past year where I've been the only one in the office. Um, and, and so as Marisa said, you know, everyone's trying to find out, you know, put everything into the cloud, you know, their, their task sequences, their, their driver packs. And when we look at that, um, we communicate at my enterprise over VPN, um, you know, so now we're saturating the VPN, which is also used for exchange. Um, we had used 1E Nomad, which works great in the office for distributing our content in a uh, closed network, but over the internet, not so much. So uh, what we find is our internal infrastructure, we, we put all these, uh, you know, the 1E Nomad, we put distribution points, and those are, are kind of withering because nobody's here to use them. Um, and then we talk about moving things to the cloud, you know, all of the added cost, the, the CPU, the storage, the egress, the man hours to shift everything. And, and essentially, you know, I, I looked at what we're doing and uh, we're literally paying to be a bridge between the manufacturer and the client and to host their content. We're taking their driver packs, we're downloading them, we're converting them however we want to convert them and we're hosting them when the content itself is already out in the cloud. So it's like we're, we're doing it twice. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So am I in control here? Um, yeah, okay. It's, it's still me that's sharing. Do I need to move on? Are you okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah, next one. So how's it going? OST Cloud was, it was kind of a new uh, concept of pulling the drivers uh, during a deployment from the cloud. And I actually worked this solution backwards um, rather than taking what we have and try to port it to the cloud. Um, I started with a blank slate. You know, I have an image here. I have a, uh, and, and drivers weren't even involved in initially. And it became to how I can image this box without relying on uh, deployment infrastructure. And so that led to the OSD PowerShell module growing and growing to contain um, uh, over a hundred functions that are related to OS deployment. And then once I got to the point where, okay, I have all the functions I need to, um, you know, disk part to clear the drive to, to do all this and that, to, to actually deploy in a VM, you know, working backwards. Okay, now here's my driver pack. Um, how do I install it? Got that sorted out. Now, how can I get the driver pack from the cloud? Uh, became the next step. And, and uh, after working backwards, uh, I was able to build something that works by pulling directly from Dell or HP or Lenovo. So, Understanding that if we don't have to host the driver packages, then we're not paying costs associated with storage and, and CPU. Um, bandwidth is bandwidth. We're going to pay it whether we pull it, you know, from, a, you know, a cloud distribution point or whether we pull it from Dell. Um, and it's a lot cheaper than including man hours and infrastructure into the mix. So the way it works is essentially this. Um, I have the OSD PowerShell module inside WinPE and uh, I solve the problem of getting PowerShell gallery working in PE. And so what that means is I'm always able to update the module um, which contains all the functions and the logic. And what, what that gives the client, whatever you're working on, it gives it the ability to instead of relying on a, an internal server where the clients uh, or the server during a task sequence configuration manager would say, this is the driver pack you need. 
um, to now the client says, I already know what driver pack I need and I know exactly where to get it. And I don't even need to talk to configuration manager at all. And, and so um, additionally, adding curl.exe, which Microsoft was nice to include starting with Windows 1809, made downloading stuff uh, a breeze. Um, driver packs are large, you know, a gig and a half. And when we have to do, you know, web request, uh, that gig uh, driver pack is really going to slow down PowerShell. Um, do we have enough temporary space in WinPE memory to, to run it? Probably not. So there are some challenges and using curl uh, really uh, allowed this process, this whole process to work. And so uh, looking down to the second last bullet, the driver pack is expanded in the specialized phase and installed using PNP unattend slash audit, which is native to Windows. Uh, and this statement's not entirely true. It's, it's expanded in the specialized phase and that's only because HP and Lenovo compressed their driver packs in a 32-bit uh, EXE. Uh, the HP packs can be unzipped using 7-zip or any zip utility, um, but uh, the Lenovo is quite a challenge. It has to run the executable. Now, Dell, uh, they've been nice enough to leave their driver packs as CAD files, which they've done from the beginning, and those can be extracted by WinPE, and then we can use Add Windows Driver uh, PowerShell, which is just a wrapper for DISM, um, to add the driver to the offline OS. And all of the drivers are fully installed from uh, before out-of-box experience starts. Um, do we have a next slide or is this demo time now? Demo time for uh, you, Dave. All right, good. I'm getting through a few of these questions as well, whatever. All right, good. So. What we have here is uh, WinPE. Um, there's really not much to it. Um, I'm gonna set my display resolution to 1600 to make things a little larger. This is another function that's part of the OSD module. Uh, we can see there's a lot of different functions in OSD. But what we what I ended up doing is putting this into a single function, start OSD cloud. Now, because this is a virtual machine, it's not going to give me any drivers, but I've also added the ability to specify a manufacturer, and I can say Dell and product, which Lenovo has a product, Dell has a uh, system SKU. Um, Product just sounds better. Um, and we're gonna get a product code 030A33, really doesn't matter. And uh, we can see here when this starts, it, we're gonna check for connection to PowerShell gallery. Um, we're gonna specify build. This was just added in the latest release. We're gonna go with number six for enterprise. I forgot to say English, so I'm just gonna enter eight for English US. And this is really just a pre-flight where it checks to make sure that it can download um, the ESD file from Microsoft. And then it runs a get my driver pack, which because I specified OA33 is my product, it's associated that with this driver pack, a Latitude 3120. And there's no mistake why I chose this pack. It is the smallest pack uh, I can download for this demonstration. Um, here, I'm just going to skip an autopilot injection. And uh, we're just going to kick this process off. Uh, this is going to be cooking style, where you're going to see me put it in the oven and uh, pop out a complete meal. Um, so we'll let that cook in the background. And we can see Curl downloading the feature update here. Uh, 13 minutes, okay, that's not good. But we'll shift over to um, 
one of these pre-made meals I have here. And if you guys can see that the VM, it's uh, my machine, my VM name is Dell 0A33, which is the product that I used. And if we look in this process, um, we can see after the save feature update, it expanded the feature update, and then it ran another function called save my driver pack, where it actually got this cab file and downloaded it from the internet. Um, and this is a little error here, unable to expand in WinPE. It actually did expand this um, because it's a Dell, so I'll have to edit that. But if I pop open Explorer, which is part of the MS Dart toolkit, I can see that in my drivers, this is where I downloaded the cab file to, and this is where it expanded it out. And if I look further back into the script, um, it supplied these drivers. I can tell it supplied these drivers because I can see the, the timestamp. It went from 49 minutes and 53 seconds to 52 minutes and eight seconds. So I know uh, approximately two minutes of that was injecting these drivers. I can further check to make sure that it's been injected by looking in my offline OS at C Windows INF, and I should be able to find uh, a ton of OEM INFs. The, this, this is how Windows adds drivers and assigns them an OEM. And we're not gonna see anything special here once I reboot. This is going to uh, simply breeze into the specialized phase and continue on to out-of-box experience because there's nothing to do. The drivers have already been injected. And in the case of, uh, of HP, which I have here, we can see that, um, and I did set disk res without specifying a resolution. So it did 1920. We can see that in this one, I told it it's an HP ProBook with a product of 8735. And so it's downloaded the uh, executable it needs from this URL. And it cannot expand this in WinPE because this exe is, com is compiled uh, with 32-bit. So if we look and explore on this one, and let's change my resolution to 1600, so it actually fits. If we look under drivers, all we have is a single executable. And so what we're gonna do here is, let's give this a reboot and let that cook. We're gonna come back to our Dell system here, which should be in the specialized phase no, nope, it's completed the specialized phase. It's going to reboot into out-of-box experience now. But what we want to look at is what we're seeing now on the VM. This is the first boot. It's always the first boot. It's specialized. And it's a, it's a mini uh, OS, if you may. You don't have full WMI. Uh, and so you can't really do anything super complex here. You can't install applications. It's it's not what it's made for. But what we can do is we can run uh, the native uh, PNP util command, uh, the PNP on attend command to add these drivers. And we can actually run the executable to expand it. And so this problem was solved by adding a command to uh, the unattend for the specialized phase that told it look in the driver's directory for EXEs uh, that have not been un uncompressed. And so it's going to kick off in just a second. It will find the HP driver pack that's been downloaded. It will uncompress it, and then it will add it to the driver store so that uh, all of our hardware should be there uh, within the next boot. And we're gonna see it happen any second. Fingers crossed.
There it is. It's a very simple PowerShell function that is going to read the properties of the EXE to determine if it's an HP or Lenovo. And we can see it's read the EXE properties and it knows that it is compiled using HP soft pack wrapper and it's expanding it right now. We can't, we don't see any activity, but the next thing we see is we see the unpack of the executable so that everything's in place. So, so David, you, you said you were um, kind of struggling with some Lenovo extractions. Uh, no, that's handled now. Um, and it probably may be a little better if I find the actual code for that to give everyone an idea. Have you come across, they did introduce a thing where if you put in the silent extract path, um, that it basically popped up like a warning dialogue. Now, um, I, I was told it should be removed for all models, but I know that there's still some out there where it happens. It's just worth noting. Um, because if you try to extract them yeah. to any other, anywhere else in the default, it will uh, just... Exactly. Yeah, pop it'll, it'll pop up a dialogue and it'll warn you. So you have to let Lenovo extract to a subdirectory called SCCM. That's where it wants to extract. And, and this is how we find the match. We look at the EXE version info file description for Lenovo. If so, then we're going to give it this argument list. And once uh, the process has completed, once it's been expanded, we're going to add a key to the registry, a string and a value, and uh, run PNP unattend. Now PNP unattend has to find this registry entry there for it to work or it won't work. Um, and then once the drivers have been added, we're gonna remove that registry key. And this is all happening in the specialized phase. And we can see um, this is complete. So, this is a, a quick demo on, on how it works um, in a task sequence. And just to let you know, to support that, there is a function called, uh, as part of the OSD module, get my driver pack. And this is going to determine what your product is, or in Dell's case, it is a system SKU, but this will return a product, and this is that product code. If I want to look at all Dell's driver packs, I can do get Dell driver pack, and we can see all of their supported models with the product and the download link. In order to support Lenovo and HP, there's also a get HP driver pack or a get uh, Lenovo driver pack, which returns the same thing. So, and of course, all of those again are uh, supported by get my driver pack, but you can specify a manufacturer. And in this case, we're going to tell it a Novo, and then I can tell it product. And let's just grab this one here. And it's going to pull the driver pack for that product. So we can spoof it, which is what we're doing uh, uh, in the virtual environment. Um, in order to do my testing, this is exactly what I did. Um, at the very top, you can see the command line. I specify a manufacturer and a product. That way I can do all my driver testing without even leaving uh, VM environment. It's great. Um, anyway, all of this is, is relatively and fairly new. Um, this does require open internet. I plan on working on um, some... Um, a proxy, adding some proxy detection. You can read all about this um, at osdcloud.com, which will forward you and redirect you to this subdirectory. Um, and this is going to explain a lot of the concepts, uh, the OSD cloud driver packs and, and, and how it works is all detailed here. And um, a practical 
uh, example of how to get this in MDT to uh, uh, actually run with MDT, which um, I've highlighted on here, the community. Uh, Jeff, for example, I'm going to call him out. He's actually got this working in MDT, um, pulling drivers straight from the internet. And so he's going from MDT with uh, over 100 gigs of drivers to now having zero uh, gigs of drivers and just pulling the latest in real time from the cloud. And uh, just to add, um, there are over 700 unique um, packs that can be pulled. Maurice has the same number uh, plus the Microsoft Surface that can be pulled using modern driver management. Um, but you know the resources, the drivers you need for your computer are out there, and and this is just a different way to get it. Um, and again, this is new, so hopefully we'll we'll see more to come out of this uh, in the near future. Um, yeah, just just one thing, David. Um, it, Bert in, in Bert Clark in the uh, the chat raises a, a good point about um, you know people are just getting hold of consumer devices today. You know, is there a way that we can cater for them? But I'm sure you've probably figured this out as well. They don't create managed driver packs for consumer devices, and they don't provide feeds for them either. Um, one, you know, and that, that's very, very topical. Um, you know, I was literally on a chat with uh, Andrew Jimenez last night, um, and hopefully I'm not going to share any of our dark secrets, but, you know, the way the driver packs, you know, he's got an Inspiron. But the way the, the, uh, the driver packs are listed, we can take this product and we can sort it. And, you know, if, if you know your Inspiron, you can still run this Get My Computer product, which is another function. And it tells me it's an 0832 on my box. But if I sort the product, I can essentially pinpoint with, uh, you know, fairly decent accuracy what a similar latitude is because, you know, Dell just doesn't make unique products. They will take uh, a, a motherboard and use it in an Inspiron consumer level. They'll also make some minor tweaks for a latitude uh, enterprise device. And if you can find one of these products that are pretty close to the one you have, um, then my solution, like I showed, uh, you can override the product detection and, and download this driver pack and this should work. So um, that's one way to do it. And you can see here, uh, the screenshot I sent to uh, Andrew is, you know, when you start it, okay, you've got a Dell Inspiron, but tell it you've got this Dell Latitude and it will download that driver pack and use that. So uh, not guaranteed to work. Um, it's going to be an experiment. Uh, that's feedback that really needs to go back to Dell, you know, provide these driver packs, um, for consumer devices. Um, and maybe something will come out of it. I doubt they will, um, because the enterprise class devices have a specific department because they have to support them in SCCM, which has funding. And for them to test every consumer device is probably well outside the scope of of what they're designed to do. Yeah, the, the only the only way I came up with uh, doing this in in uh, our solution is to do something like this. So inside the DAT, you can do a custom package creation. So all you need to do is really specify the uh, build the windows, the architecture, and then you query. Now I'm running this on on a virtual machine, obviously, okay, but it will then use WMI to detect the make, model, and baseboard value from the machine, okay? Then we, we extract the system drivers. So what you would do in, in theory is you'd take one of these consumer models out of the box, you'd run this on the consumer model, it'll explore all the drivers, okay, using um, uh, DISM, um, and then you would import them onto the configuration manager box. And there you are, you have, you have a driver pack for that model. So Awesome, yeah, that is definitely the way to do it. The only other way I could think of, but it, it, like, yeah, we just don't have feeds to consumer stuff. That's basically what it is. 
see Gary in chat saying this is brilliant. He's he's been saying that all week. Uh, I think that's his his favorite. But Gary, great resource. Thanks for joining, Gary. Shout out. You'll get MVP this time. Yeah, I I I, I think Gary should have had a long time ago, but that's just uh, my opinion. Um and about five thousand other people's <laughs> opinions. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um so where does this stuff go in the future? This is the kind of thing as well. I mean, we're, we've got your, a lot of questions coming in um, and we will we'll take time to answer them. Um, but let's just talk about, you know, where, where this goes. Um, so you might have seen at, uh, at Ignite, they announced that, um, you know, firmware updates, for instance, for like say HP devices now are coming down from Windows Update for Business for Intune, which is really good um, in one, one respect because it means you're always getting the latest firmware. Some people kind of freaked out because they had a load of supported models and then all of a sudden they're going, ah, we don't want to do this. How do we stop? So you do have to uh, configure a BIOS setting to, to stop it doing this. Um, but the the kind of short-term thing that I, I'm saying, and I've said it from the offset, is that community solutions like what, what I do, what David does, et cetera, they are going to be there for as long as we think there are gaps uh, to be filled or you know specific use cases like take that one there with mdt and the internet uh, yeah pulling driver packs down over the internet is something I, I, i've done as well especially with if like if you're using intune for instance it, it makes complete sense um but do we think that more is going to be come in um i i absolutely do believe that Microsoft are going to give this uh, a lot of focus. Um, and it is one of those areas, particularly in Configuration Manager, that hasn't had a lot of love. Um, so I, I, I would expect developments coming along the lines. And OEMs have been doing a great job, as I said, especially likes of HP with their, their PowerShell module, because now you can basically, um, and we've actually sorry, done this for a, a customer, we were deploying um, MTR devices, so meeting room devices by HP. And they wanted to be able to um, control the BIOS and the drivers and all of them. So we created a, um, a couple of proactive remediations because um, they're managed by Intune. And the first one is really just to ensure that the HP CMS module is installed and up to date. Uh, and then the second one just runs every so often and it goes off and says, give me the latest driver pack, give me the latest firmware. And it goes ahead and updates the device. Um, now, there are, you can have control mechanisms in that where it checks you know, on an XML or something or feed to see which version you published before it goes ahead and updates the machines. Um, but, you know, that's, that's effectively using native PowerShell solutions that are coming from the vendors today, which I think is uh, night and day compared to what it was a few years ago. Have you been playing around with that, David? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was I was looking in the Q and A to see what I can handle. Um, but you know what what you said about the manufacturers improving. Yes, I think autopilot has been a big driver for that, um, because they've been told you need to have this available in the cloud. Um, Windows Update for Business. Yes, we need it now. Unfortunately, that's a Q4 thing. Uh, unless you're picked as one of the early adopters. Uh, my concern is, can I get that to work in WinPE, my pre-boot environment? So my drivers are there before I get to that uh, autopilot uh, screen. And whatever else you said after that, I missed. My apologies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I mean, the other bits I would like to see in there, um, you know, given the fact that they are getting feeds directly from OEMs and things like that, that they would... Um, allow us to create update rings in the same way that you would have Windows update rings, right? So let's say, don't give me the latest driver pack, give me uh, N minus one and do that for production. And for IT, give them the latest one because inevitably it's like everything. You know, you play the latest update for Windows or for Farm or something, something can break. So we need that kind of control mechanism in place. Um, so I think really now, um, let's have a look through the questions and see if we can answer some of them, uh, together maybe, um, for about the next, I might be here for about the next 15 minutes or so. Um, 
Okay, well, yeah, the slides so be available. Yeah. I'll take a question live from Mike Marable. Uh, David, is it possible to specify a particular Windows build, i.e. 1909 versus the latest to pull from Microsoft with OSD Cloud? Uh, we're, not, we're not pulling, oh yeah, to pull a particular Windows build. Sorry, this isn't driver related. Uh, yes, there is a OS build parameter in the start OSD cloud where you can go all the way back to 1809. Yeah, that's good because you don't always get a uh, driver pack specific to the model being on like 20H2 and things like that. Well, I, I did cheat. I did not, uh, I am not matching the driver pack to the OS build. Oh, um, okay. I am pulling the latest no matter what. And in some cases, uh, a vendor may only have driver pack to 1909. Uh, and if you're deploying 20H2 uh, and looking for a 20H2 uh, driver pack, it doesn't exist. So it is always going to pull the latest. Um, I guess I can look into doing uh, matching, better matching. Um, and, and, I've also cheated with Dell. There's some old Dell models that aren't listed as supporting Windows 10, so they may be using Windows 8.1 drivers. Those have been promoted <laughs> as Windows 10 drivers. But it's been an effort to try and get as many devices supported, and whether they work or not, somebody is going to tell me. Yeah, but you, you put your cell phone number on the support page on your website in case it goes wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, Paid support, well, it's always available. See, see, we have a question there from uh, Patrick Stromberg. Um, and I, this one kind of comes up quite a lot um, about OEMs maintaining the actual driver pack themselves. So you might often find that you download the latest driver pack and you go on to the actual model and you'll find newer drivers. That, that happens. Yes, it does yeah. happen. Um, so, okay, it, it, in, in a solution... Uh, we have the modern driver management. All you need really to do is download the latest, say, if it's an audio driver, download it, extract it, and then replace that inside the driver pack if you want, if that's what you want to do. Okay, and that'll work. And then just redistribute the package. Or using the HP tool that will update the drivers and post and don't worry about it uh, um, in deployment is another approach. You're never going to have the latest drivers. I mean, as soon as you download that driver pack from Dell, uh, you've turned it static. It's no longer in real time the latest driver because they could replace it one minute after you've downloaded it and you won't know until the next time you you uh, go to pull your updates. Yeah, it, it, it's always a struggle. And like it is. The, yeah. the, the other thing is that OEMs only update the sources maybe once or twice a month as well. So yeah, you, you might say to David, you might say to me, okay, we've been using a solution and it was meant to find the latest driver pack, but here's a newer one. Um, unfortunately, you know, we're querying a source and that source just gets updated on a, on a uh, scheduled basis. Post, post those, uh, give us an FYI, but yeah, those, I think if we start hitting Dell and, and HP and Lenovo enough saying, hey, there's a newer driver pack, you haven't put it in your feed, they'll do it. I've seen Lenovo uh, really good about uh, responding to consume to uh, to uh, notifications that it isn't fixed, and they've they've addressed that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I know Lenovo are very good for doing that, and I know at times as well we we've had certain OEMs that break their XML now and again. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced that one, David, but I I certainly have. Um, but yeah, it tends to be a temporary thing because if they publish something that's broken, their own tools will stop working as well. So, um, but just bear that in mind. I mean, uh, community solutions depend on OEM links and OEM files. So yeah. it's as, as good as the, uh, the code it's fed. <laughs> well, I mean, some great stuff is coming out of this. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, for the whole situation, but, you know, we've seen a major push for cloud first everything, whether it's drivers, OS deployment, uh, autopilot has really picked up. I don't think we would be, uh, it would have gotten as much traction as it has without COVID. You know, it would still be 
moving forward, but now it's it's probably been uh, made top priority by Microsoft. And you can tell with all the cloud stuff they're doing, they have uh, you know taken this and and gotten in the driver's seat, um, you know, to get ahead of this. Um, and yeah, it is unfortunate. And and uh, but you know, it, for us representing a an enterprise. We were very, um, we weren't in the forefront of cloud. And once COVID hit, everything's got to be in the cloud. Everything's got to be available. And, and this is something that probably sped up our cloud transition timelines uh, by several months or even a year. Um, but it's sped it up considerably for us. And I'm, and I'm proud of that. Yeah. And I'm curious as well. I mean, we've got quite a lot of people on today, but like like your experience there, moving to the cloud, how many have ditched on-premise and gone straight into Intune? Anyone going to just pipe up in the, in the chat window and say if you've gone that journey? CMG. Yeah, mostly gone CMG, which is yeah. absolutely, I mean, everyone wanted a CMG in the morning as soon as COVID hit. Um, uh, and I think it's uh, it depends on where you are geographically. Like in in, in Europe, I've seen like a big push to, to to get rid of the on-premise hardware and move straight into cloud managed um, only environments. Um, and in the US, it, it, it's completely different. But I think that the really good thing that Microsoft has done over the past year is made this thing as available as possible to everyone uh, and the work that they've done in configuration manager in particular in a, in a 12 month period has been immense. Absolutely. Yes. You know, so it's a big shout out to all of those uh, developers and, and project managers and so on in Microsoft, because um, they have added features, which are probably on the long finger for many years in the space of a couple of months. So I, I think we need to, let's try and answer some questions and, and kind of close this out. Uh, do you want to answer some live questions? Uh, will there be a recording? Um, we're live on YouTube. Can, yeah. can it be replayed, Mark? It can. All these, uh, this as well, I thought I've answered it a few times. Um, all these uh, webinars in this community tool series, including this one, are on the Recast Software YouTube channel. If you look through some of the other answered questions, uh, you should have the link in there at least a couple of times to see. So I've got a question from Kathy Williams. Uh, for those of us trying to set up computers from home, would David Solution work with offline media? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's already been built in. Um, there is uh, the option to create an OSD cloud USB. Um, behind me, I have a Lenovo device, which power, no connection. And I have this set up with USB. My drivers are on here. My test connection to PowerShell gallery has failed. And as long as I have the driver pack and the proper addition uh, uh, of the OS, this whole thing is going to run off the stick. I don't even need the cloud. Well, we'll skip the autopilot, but yes. And this is important. Every solution I, I, I do, there, there has to be, well, it wants me to remove USB, but there's gotta be an offline solution. I, my company, we're an oil services company. And so we have to image machines offline without any network connectivity. So yes, to answer your question, this will work completely offline, provided you have saved the driver pack to the USB. Um, I want to, before we continue answering questions, there was one thing I think we were supposed to bring up before going to the end, any questions slide, and I forgot to bring it up here. Um, all attendees of uh, all these community tools webinars are actually eligible for a uh, free seven day enterprise trial of right click tools enterprise. I'm just going to quick paste that link to, to sign up. Oh, actually it looks like uh, Chelsea slash Scott just 
pop that in chat. So uh, feel free to click on that. And you can get a uh, free seven day trial license of enterprise tools, uh, but we can get back to Q and A now. Okay, so just look through there through the questions. Let's see, okay, uh, I've had several cabs at Dell. I've broken downloads included, so the drivers could not be installed. Yeah, if that happens, it's really get back to the OEM and report it. Um, uh, I know I've also had some other issues uh, with unsigned drivers from some vendors as well. Um, and if you got that, it's not really a good place to be. So again, just get back to the OEM in that instance. Uh, one for you, David. David, is there an option to auto select the version Pro versus Enterprise, for instance? There is. It's a uh, parameter with OSD Cloud. Um, let me share my screen, and it would just be quicker doing it this way. And I know, uh, let's see, screen one. Um, yes, it's ICE, but ICE is so cool with letting me Zoom uh, stuff. So... We have OS build, OS edition, OS language. So yes, I can select um, 1809, OS edition, um, home. Uh, so yes, hopefully that answers that. Uh, another one select there. the language, but yes, I can auto select OS language like that. Good. Cool. Uh, another one. How often do you update drivers and BIOS on the device? Uh, well, I personally would say just keep it part of your normal patching regime. So you know, once a month, really, if you can. Um, schedule it in, have something like a toast notification or something to, to that effect just to tell the, uh, the end user that something's about to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of security issues that come out uh, with uh, bias firmware updates and and uh, stability with the driver updates, so keep it part of your normal patching regime. Hey, David, for the record, you can actually use Visual Studio Code to zoom in and out as well. Control plus and Control minus. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just give you a hard time. Um, keep those so shades people... on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, some people are asking about this, the slide deck. Will it be made available, Mark? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I am not sure. Let me uh, let me check with our marketing folks on that, actually, while you guys are continuing with the other questions. Yeah. Um, uh, another question I saw was around about the, the task sequence that I showed earlier on. Will it be made available? Yes, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make those available again. Uh, Mark, I'll leave it up to you maybe or... What I can do is I can put it up on my GitHub, and maybe Mark could send out a link. As, as yeah, I'll I'll share it with follow. our marketing team because they control our Twitter account. They don't let me anywhere near that for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, we well, I, I'm talking to our marketing folks as well. well. We'll figure out a way to share the slide decks out as well, and and uh, the official Recast Software Twitter account will uh, share out links to all this stuff. I, I think Brian Dam should be in charge of that. Yeah, that wouldn't go well. But <laughs> 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 um. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple of other things. So questions, how do you think uh, myself or David can improve our tools as well? Let me, let me interrupt that just for a second. I'm going to leave this displaying. We can keep on the questions, but this is the Lenovo that was built offline and uh, going through its driver extraction um, in the specialized phase. And again, this was image completely off of the USB. It found the matching EXE by name and uh, copied that over to stage it for specialized phase. So driver ext extraction, just like the HP, and then it's going to apply the drivers. So hopefully you guys can see that. That's so, cool. Thank you. Um, I suppose we, we should talk a little bit about the, the recast right-click tools as well. Oh, um, yeah. 
<laughs> strong. Yeah. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you, Recast, for giving us uh, opportunity today to, to talk to everyone, and uh, I think we've had a good turnout. Um, I know I've been using the right-click tools for years, but the one piece of advice I would say to everyone is when you're pushing a group policy update, don't check the user checkbox on several thousand devices when you push that button. Um, <laughs> or you too will be like me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the user, the user policy yes. one will uh, show H- a command by... prompt, unfortunately, on the user screen. Computer policy will not. The user policy one, unfortunately, with Windows 10, there's not a great way of avoiding that prompt. I, I've looked into that, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, yes. Being hated so by I... several thousand users and your client <laughs> is never a good thing. <laughs> yeah, and I also want to say thank you for a recast for reaching out. Uh, and Maurice, thank you. Um, Recast, awesome thing you guys are doing, putting these uh, webcasts together. I will be available to speak on whatever you guys want uh, anytime. Um, loved it. This is this was a great experience. And uh, um, if I don't get to answer your question, if it's related to OSD Cloud or even not related to OSD Cloud, if it's just anything driver or PE, reach out to me on Twitter, uh, Maurice on Twitter, or... Uh, you know, you can, you can track us down by email, but, w- you know, we're only here because we're always available to, to you guys, the community. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, helping us, um, you know, promote our tools and, and be, a, be a part of the community. One of the best yeah, like- things about our field of work is we have such an awesome community that's always willing to help each other. Even our product was actually kind of, uh, you know, we have our community version and you know, the enterprise version eventually branched out of that. So it wouldn't exist without, uh, without the community, which is why we're so focused on contributing back to it in ways like this. Yeah, and I think we, we can all say that we all help hope that uh, physical conferences become a thing again because it's, you know, Doing virtual is great, but it's really nice to meet up and those kind of side chats that you have with people and meeting people. I mean, I wouldn't have met Mark unless I was at a... I think the first time I came across was um, not MMS, but the... I met you at Minskog, actually. You yeah, and Maurice one. came out for, I think, was it OSD Day? Yeah, it was year? OSD Day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, we were at the Surly Brewery, which now closed because of COVID, unfortunately. Or, well, maybe because of code. It might have been something else, but they, they're they they're actually close now. But uh, oh, damn. Yeah, those were good times. Hopefully yeah, we'll get back I, to those I, soon. Yeah, exactly. So fingers crossed, maybe uh, MMS Miami or something like that come, comes to fruition. I'd be surprised if it doesn't. Uh, I, it might be hard, I know, for a lot of the uh, um, Europeans to travel there. But uh, I, I think uh, with US, we're projecting a ton of vaccinations and Florida's, I don't think, ever had any strict rules and... Um, so I don't think there's any reason it wouldn't happen at this point. We so just hope our Europeans friends can join us. <laughs> yeah, maybe you could just give me a vaccination when I get there or something. Put me in a hotel room for a week. I'll be fine then, but I'd love to come across. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we should talk um, to Brian, see if he can get a program going on, on, uh, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsored vaccines. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. Well, look, fingers crossed. And, and look, the main thing is that everyone at the moment just stay safe. Uh, hopefully, we all get through this and we all get back to uh, living normal lives uh, and doing uh, IT conferences again. Yeah. Let me answer this one question, Jason Hunter. Can this method be used with autopilot? My understanding if autopilot finds an unattend XML file, it bypasses autopilot. Uh, yeah, kind of not really. Uh, the way that um, so with MDT, if you're using MDT and uh, the specialized driver phase, you have to put this in your unattend file for it to work. If you are doing straight OSD cloud uh, where you image and then drop the pack, it's actually going to add an entry in the registry um, for the specialized phase and remove itself. So Microsoft may even be unaware uh, and, and it shouldn't interfere with autopilot. Autopilot's worked um, perfectly uh, when I've done an OSD cloud deployment with the drivers. So everything should be fine. And I don't okay, think that- we're going to be able to get to all these questions, but um, Mark, are we able to answer these questions, like come back later and post or 
Uh, if uh, you guys are still on the call, do, do you want to pose these questions to us on Twitter? Yeah, um, we're, we're, in actually... our we're in our time. I would definitely suggest the Twitter route. Um, if you have any of these questions, uh, I think we had uh, their, their Twitter handles up early on. Otherwise, uh, if you uh, send them at the Recast Software one, we can kind of, if you're not aware of their Twitter handles, we can definitely respond and share them. But yeah, David's put his in there. Um, Maurice, I'm trying to remember yours off the top of my head. Maybe you could throw yours in chat one last time. Chelsea's saying we, we can send the QA to you guys. Oh, perfect. perfect. Um, they have a survey, is that right, Mark, that they can, they can probably add a question to? I have no idea. I'm sorry. All I do is moderate this. All our marketing folks handle like the logistics behind the webinars. But uh, I mean, you can always ask questions on the YouTube channel. Our marketing folks monitor like all these channels we have and, and we'll find one way or another to, to get these questions to you guys and so we can get them answered publicly. Uh, I'll answer this one, Damien, contribution guide. Uh, if you're volunteering to contribute, please reach out to us. Uh, <laughs> Me and Maurice, yeah, we definitely would absolutely appreciate uh, contributions to any of our work. Yeah, and, and like I said, this year has been really busy for me, but thankfully, I'm, I'm, I can't announce you to people, but there's uh, there's people joining our company I work for in, in the next month. Um, and uh, hopefully that takes a bit of the uh, pressure off and I can do some more of this stuff as well for you guys. So. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, it is a challenge for us to test everything, all these drivers. I don't have any HP hardware whatsoever, and that's where these parameters where I can spoof and tell it you are this, so I can test it in a VM has really helped. But um, you guys in the field that actually have this hardware, you're, you're testing it for us, and, and please let us know, um, you know, if, if something's not working right or if you're seeing an issue. Uh, we definitely love to hear about it. Yeah, and, and don't get upset at us. We don't have all the hardware. So, <laughs> yes, you, you are the beta testers. <laughs> Maybe if you send them uh, one, you know, one of the machines for free to, to, to have, <laughs> they'd be more likely to test on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, I, I think that's, are we done here? Yeah, I think we should probably wrap this up. Question, we'll try and follow up, but reach out, please. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. And and one last thank you to both Maurice and David for joining us. Uh, and everybody, everybody, enjoy the rest of your week. Yeah, have a good thanks, one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.